are you doing today? Hello. Yeah? It's sunny outside. Really? I hear there's a typhoon coming. <laughs> Let's enjoy this while it's here. Um, okay, so today we have a panel where we're going to be talking about mixers. Um, we, I think maybe just to start off, so we, we only have one microphone, so you'll have to bear with us. We're going to have to be doing a little bit of passing. Um, but I think to start off, why don't we just introduce ourselves, why don't you guys give a quick intro to who you are and how your project relates to mixers. Hi, uh, my name is Wei Jie. Uh, I'm based in Singapore, I work with the ETM Foundation, and I'm working on a zero-knowledge signaling gadget called Semaphore, which is a base layer for a mixer called Micromix. Hey guys, uh, my name is Jay from Loopprint Protocol. So Loopprint Protocol is using a, a ZK Snarks to enable people to build up a decentralized, you know, high-performance, non-custodian, scalable decentralized exchange. <laughs> um, I'm Julian, one of the co-founders of Arjun, so we are a smart contract based wallet and we've been working on Hopper, an open source privacy mixer. Hello, I'm Roman Storm, uh, we're working on a privacy solution called Arneda Cash. Cool. Okay, so I think probably most of the people in this audience know what a mixer is, but I always like to start off a panel with a couple definitions. So, what is a mixer and what is it for? I think in, in a nutshell, a mixer is a privacy tool that breaks the link between addresses, so which is different than uh, confidentiality, so we're talking about privacy. So it is not a sender and a recipient being known, but you don't know what they are doing. In this case, you don't know who's doing, uh, who's sending a fixed amount of money to whom. Do you guys have any, is there anything else you can say about what a mixer is or isn't? Right, so there are two types of mixers. Uh, one is a centralized mixer. These have been around since, like, for many, many years. Uh, even since the early 2000s. Like, you, no, uh, early 2010s. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you put in, you go to bitcoinfog.com or something like that, and then you put in bitcoin, you trust that they'll give it back to a different address, and they usually do, or they exit scan and you lose some money. But I think what we all do here, <laughs> what we do all do here is like a trustless mixer, so you put in the, the funds somewhere, and because it uses smart contracts and or some kind of doing knowledge stuff, um, you, no one can exit scan. So that's the, that's the point of today's panel. One quick comment that I should add, uh, Mixer, it could be used as a product which could provide uh, on-chain anonymity and also uh, metadata anonymity. Uh, what I mean by that, on-chain anonymity will provide you the anonymity of your transactions uh, on the public blockchains. Uh, metadata anonymity will provide you solutions like Tor uh, proxies, like to hide your metadata of your browsing sessions. Um, and also from an exchange perspective, um, I would say uh, like uh, like back in the old days, uh, a central exchange is a uh, like first generation mixer. So like large well, they just send the uh, token like Bitcoin into a central exchange, then with joining different addresses. So, like also they can use Sharp Sharp as well. So you started to hint about like the history of mixers, but what what were the early mixers exactly? What were they called? If you, if anyone knows here. Um, like, who, where did this first, where did this idea first, first emerge? <laughs> so, as I remember, one of the most, uh, the first, maybe not the first one, but one of the early mixers was a coin join uh, in a Bitcoin uh, that, uh, it, it was called mixer, but, uh, I like, if, if you look at it technically, if you observe uh, all the inputs and outputs in that uh, solution, it will still not give you the full anonymity. Uh, comparing to uh, privacy tools that is using uh, zero knowledge proofs behind the scenes, uh, such as, uh, I mean, ZK Snarx and other technologies. Uh, then the, the next, okay, yeah, I'm going to the next phase, which is uh, uh, zero knowledge based uh, mixers, which is like, we're in a very, very early stage in these uh, solutions. Um, basically, they provide you a way 
that when you can deposit some of your funds, uh, then like using some sort of rules such as uh, anonymity sets, uh, you can establish a full privacy of your transaction when you're going to exit the mixture of funds to some new address. So you can break the, uh, the, uh, the chain of links in your whole transaction history. I think maybe if you want to go even further, I think cash has been mixed for many, many years. And that's what people did to launder money, for example. So I think the first mixer of laundry machines <laughs> in Chicago and New York in the forties. Uh, yeah, I agree. I completely agree. I was about to say Bitcoin, but then you just mentioned cash. Look, uh, cash, I mean, at best too for money launderers. Uh, and also there's a lot of local dealers. Uh, they are like uh, the individual mixer. Um, probably from all the days, so they receive money, um, you don't need to do KYC, and then pass to someone else, the next receiver, uh, they don't also do, they don't, not, uh, they don't need to uh, uh, do the KYC, so I, I think that's the, uh, probably the first uh, mixer uh, in the history. Um, I think the only thing I'll add is like, we want also want to think about our adversary model, so who, uh, who, who do we want privacy from? Do we want privacy from the state or do we want privacy from a neighbor? So those are two very different things and can have different implications in how you do, do your mixing. Just a quick note. Uh, we, for uh, we forgot to, when, to mention the two more important protocols that are also involved in the privacy solutions on chain, which is uh, ring signatures and uh, Mimbo Wimbo protocols. Uh, Mimbo Wimbo is used in a uh, and Green uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, Ring Signatures is using in uh, a Monero cryptocurrency. And the ZK Snarks, one of the most widely popular blockchain, is a uh, Zcash. That was actually the point I was also going to make. It's like, how does Monero fit into this? Um, you sort of you just outlined the Ring Signatures and the zero knowledge proof. What, what was there a third one that you just said? Mimbo Wimbo. Is Mimbo Wimbo its own? Uh, it's a protocol, and uh, from this protocol, there was uh, two projects uh, derived from it: a green cryptocurrency yeah. and the EMU. But it's it's independent. It's not ring signature. It's not zero. It's knowledge. not. Yeah, okay. it's. So why don't we do a little bit of a comparison then? Like, so are all the projects you're working more on the zero knowledge side? <coughs> yeah. Can we still talk about like why you wouldn't do the ring signature version? Like yeah. why, you know, that's been around a little bit longer. So right. somewhat tested, why would you change that? So, in, in my opinion, uh, ring signatures um, could give you a lower, um, lower, lower like, like, it's not the best tool to use for the, uh, to give you the full anonymity of your transactions. So, let's say the ring signature, the anonymity set will be, consists of like 10, uh, 10 participants in a ring. Uh, with uh, comparing to zk snarks, uh, there is no limit. Like I mean, technically there are some limits, but it's much much higher uh, in terms of uh, your anonymity set. So anonymity set it, it means uh, how many other participants are participating in the whole process of mixing your funds with some other funds. Uh, so the ring signature in Monera, um, the they would use some uh, fixed set of uh, participants, like let's say 10. So and uh, there are some attacks that could happen. Let's say um, if I'm the first one, like I mean, if I'm if I join a, a ring, and the next person you don't know like who who were the other let's say nine participants of that ring, so the anonymity could be completely broken. I was going to say the same, but you said it better. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a bit add on. It's just like um, like for a ring signature. Uh, think about uh, if Anna come to me and lend me like a hundred bucks, then uh, Wei Jie uh, and says he need ten hundred bucks. Then I give it to Wei Jie. Even I don't know them, but I remember their face. So if you want to be anonymous, you have to wait probably another like the entire room people to come to me, like half the room to lend me the money, and I can't remember how much money is it, and half of the uh, room they come to me and, and then give them the money. Then it kind of mixed up, so I don't need to remember. Uh, it's not, I don't need to. It's, I, it's, it's hard for me to remember as a mixer. Uh, so that means that you, it takes time. Uh, to, 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 to be anonymous, that means uh, like people have to take time to wait. So the, uh, the, the timing is a, is a limitation. 
Is that only on the ring signature setup where you actually can, like, I, from what I understood that you're saying there is like, if there's only a few participants, say, then it's actually pretty easy to trace it. But if there's a lot of participants over a long period of time, then it's harder. But is that only with the ring signature type mixers, or is that also with zero knowledge style mixers? Um, I think it was even the zero knowledge style mixers. Uh, there have been uh, articles that have been written and published about, such as for Zcash, where you can de anonymize uh, even shielded transactions, but based on heuristics. So, for example, if you have uh, a lot of users who deposit into a, a shielded pool and then they immediately drop to five minutes, you can look at all the transactions and then sort of guess with high certainty that these are late. So, that's not, that's not nice, that's not good. Um, so, even so, zero knowledge is not a magic spell that makes everything disappear into the. Uh, uh, so, we have to educate users and we have to have good UI and uh, behavioral um, nudges that encourage users to uh, leave the deposits as long as possible or uh, have like good security sanity, uh, uh, security hygiene, uh, things like that. So, uh, it's not just technology, it's also about how people use it. Yeah, so, <clears throat> I was going to say probably the same, even with, with uh, mixers based on ZK Snarks, you can also attack someone. So if, if, if I know that you are going to do a transaction, actually I, I do a lot of, of mixing myself, you may think that there's 50 people, but actually you are alone. So it is kind of the same problem that, that we bring signatures, although theoretically the set is unbounded, which is a bit better. And also you depend on, on the, as, you, as we just mentioned, on behavior of other people. If people act stupidly, you might think that you have a large anonymity set, but actually your anonymity set is close to zero because all the other person are following a, a, like a, the same pattern. And so, so it's, yeah, there's, there's limitation in every technology. So that actually speaks to another question that I had, which is, like we just mentioned one limitation of mixers, but what are the other issues around mixers? Ways that mixers can actually get cracked? Is that what you say? Crack a mixer? So, as with any uh, smart contract on Ethereum, uh, there is smart contract risk. Uh, as with any cryptographic project, there is risk of the crypto, the crypto primitives or crypto systems being broken. Um, so, to address those things, you need uh, first of all audits. Second of all, you need uh, a trusted setup that allows that is like uh, something that. Uh, something like, like Zcash powers of tower trusted setup where you can uh, have a multi-party computation where uh, we only need one person out of a whole set of people to, to do the trusted setup process to be honest for the whole thing to be secure. So that's what we're doing for Seven Falls Mixer and it, the, the powers of tower ceremony is open tomorrow. Um, so if these things haven't done, then mixers could be, could be attacked. I think also always in cryptography, the primitives, the maths may be really good, but how you implement it is what creates the, the problem. For example, with mixers, today a lot of people are using Infura to access the blockchain. And actually, if you do that, you connect to an IP address. So the mixers, they are assumed to be private because we assume that people use a local node, but in practice, most users will use, use a centralized service. And actually, you're getting information by just connecting to Infura or Alchemy or any other uh, node provider. So I think that's a limitation. The second limitation in the case of Hopper, I think Semaphore, is the question of how do you transfer it to an account that doesn't have uh, ether? And so there's the question of who's paying gas, and in that case we use relayers. And again, if you access a relayer, you usually connect to a, to a service. And again, your IP address may need information, so there are solutions such as using Tor, as you mentioned before. But I think all these practical details are what may actually reduce your privacy in practice. I guess these are like externalities, they're like the things that won't necessarily be thought of when designing the cryptography, but rather in the implementation. Is there also a hardware, I mean Infura I guess is sort of in that direction, but is there any sort of like hardware issue? Or when you're implementing it on an existing blockchain, are there issues with that? So, currently right now, if you want to use a mixer that's on your mobile device, uh, you would have to have a WebAssembly enabled in your uh, mobile browser. So that would be the huge limitation for users. And also, let's say, uh, if you use a mixer with a, a much higher uh, number of, uh, level of uh, Merkle trees, 
uh, you would have to spend a lot of gas on Ethereum just to execute the withdrawal transaction. So for example, if you use a Merkle tree with a 16 levels, uh, which would give you the maximum amount of uh, transactions that could be stored in that tree, 65,000. Um, the amount of gas for each withdrawal would be around, right now, before the instant hard fork, uh, 800,000 uh, gas for the withdrawal. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned really briefly relayers. <coughs> But can you define what a relayer is in this context and how that could actually be a limitation? I think that the idea of using relayers is, as I mentioned, in the case where the recipient uh, doesn't have ether. So there's the question of how, how can you withdraw basically the secret coin that someone has minted for you. Of course, you can send him some ether so he can pay the gas, but again, that transaction will break the link. So the idea is to use uh, a third party that will actually make the withdrawal uh, on your behalf, and will be repaid the gas by, I mean, there's different mechanisms, but in the case of Hopper, for example, the person that is really within the transaction will receive part of the amount that has been part of the, part of the transfer. So the, the idea is, again, really to break uh, that link between the sender and the recipient because of the problem of paying gas on the material. And, and so and then with mixer, there's different strategies. You can have one mixer, one centralized mixer, which is the simplest. Uh, possibility, but of course, if you want to make it completely trustless, you should have a network uh, of mixers, and I think the same for guys are working on that right now. Uh, I just would like to add a few thoughts on the reware. So, at, in Tornado Cash, we also use the rewares network. And uh, for the next release, uh, we are working very hard right now with the integration of the uh, gas station network made by Open Zeppelin. I think they are working on a generic solutions to provide the relayer network for uh, any smart contract developer. Uh, so that would um, increase the level of decentralization and the level of community uh, because you could either uh, choose which relayers you want to assign the, uh, the withdrawal of your transaction or you can even spin up your own relayer and the more relayers we have in the network the better it is for everyone. And potentially, I think, we can even, maybe all the mixers could collaborate using the one set of the uh, reware network, so it would ben benefit the, the whole market. Um, we sort of talked a little bit about how zero-knowledge proofs are used for the sort of zero-knowledge proof style mixers, but where did the, where does the zero-knowledge proof exactly live? Like, what, is it done one time is it? I'd like to hear a little bit more about how those designs actually happen. Um, so first, when you deposit ETH or tokens into your mixer, that's done in the clear. But when you withdraw, you generate a ZK proof in your browser, send it, the proof to the relayer, relayer sends it to the uh, smart contract that uh, verifies the proof on chain. And uh, if it's valid, if it's valid, then it proves that that person who sent the proof uh, was a member of the set of people who deposited in the first place, but doesn't reveal the uh, exact address, uh, exact identity in the first place. Uh, I mean, the original identity. So the proof happens, uh, the verification happens on-chain, the proof is generated off-chain, the uh, the ZK snap circuit is written by the team, and, and the trusted setup is done, is done by the team as well, and also by the community. Yeah, that's, that's really good. But are all of these projects, like the, there's three projects here we are using the zero knowledge proof um, construction, are you all using it in the same way? Is it all based on the same original paper or idea? Um, I would say that I think the, the architecture of the design is the same. We are all using a, a Merkle tree based privacy mixer, so as, as we just mentioned, the idea is that you mean uh, a secret coin, which is a leaf in the Merkle tree, and then you prove that, when you withdraw, you prove that you know the secret behind one of the, the leaf in the Merkle tree, and it hasn't been double spent. So I think this construction is, is the same in all three uh, setups, but then there's, again, a lot of implementation details. What kind of hashing function do you use for your Merkle tree? What kind of hashing functions do you use to create your leaf, and so on? So all, I think in all these details, we are all a bit different because we may target uh, different use cases, but the, the global architecture is, is the same. 
And those implementation details impacts uh, heavily on how much gas consumption you're going to use. Uh, what, as you already mentioned, in different use cases uh, for different types of applications, because I don't think uh, all the mixers are trying to solve the same problem. Uh, everyone has its own view, uh, like what, what's the most important issue to solve. Yeah, even from our perspective, um, because for us, like right now, the first priority is scalability. So, but we still we, we have the uh, demands for the privacy. So we just postpone or delay the privacy. But all of the infrastructure and processes are the same. Just one more point, which is that um, all four of us and the whole ZK community working together creates a <coughs> not just a mixers but also other ZK projects creates a lot of positive side effects. So we're not just helping the Ethereum community to get better privacy options. We are also advancing uh, on zero knowledge research and development. Yeah. So it might be a bit messy, might be decentralized, might be might be like why are there four mixers when you need one? But eventually, hopefully, the efforts that everybody puts puts in can uh, allow everybody to flourish. Can you guys go into more detail of these different use cases? Because I actually would like to understand the differences between these projects. And then after that, by the way, I want to ask about like the use case for DEXs. But first, let's find out the difference between the projects. Yeah, just a super simple formula. Name one DeFi project plus privacy. That's a use case. Um, like, let's, let's say um, I'm a trader. I want. Uh, I just got a bunch of tokens from someone, I want to use that to, to trade, whatever. And I need some gas, and I don't want them to see my, my balance because I'm a whale, uh, which I'm not. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I use a mixer, I get a gas, and I trade whatever I want. Let's say I use kickback, kickback events, like you deposit some die because you want to get a spot at the event. Uh, if, you, if you don't show, then the die is distributed, distributed to other participants. But I don't want people to know that I a whale am at the event because I don't want to be kidnapped. Or uh, something like that. So, name a DeFi project, name an Ethereum project, plus privacy. That's your use case. Um, I, I want. I want to say us, but uh, I want to keep it. Uh, keep it later. <laughs> so I think in our case, as I mentioned, we are uh, at first building a smart contract based wallet. So we are a wallet, and and what we've tried to do is to actually abstract most of the complexity from the blockchain to really enable us to reach outside of this crypto bubble we are all in. So kind of target people which are less tech savvy than we all are in this room. And so if you start talking about financial application, people have some expectation of, of what it means. And people expect some kind of privacy. So our users are expecting a certain level of privacy. And actually Ethereum is a fantastic tool because it's a public ledger. It's fully transparent, but it doesn't contain that, that privacy naturally. And, and for us, the realization that I mean, the interest for Mixer came from some of our users because they wanted to provision their Argent wallet they, some of them had a lot of you know, funds on the hardware wallet, for example, and they were saying, hey, we want to provision a hardware wallet, but we don't want to create that link between this hardware wallet and our hardware wallet. So that's why we really started thinking, for us, in a very simple use case, how can you transfer E from, from a hardware wallet to an hardware wallet without creating that, that connection option? So for us, it's, it's kind of a simple use case, but it was really driven by requests from our users. Just to add a few things, the very easy explanation uh, what we're trying to solve is, let's say you have your debit card and do you, do you want to publish all your transactions from your debit card? And most, uh, most of the time people will say, no, you don't want to publish it, but that's what we're trying to solve. Because every transaction in the Ethereum space uh, in the blockchain is a publicly available to anyone and I think the privacy is the, one of the human rights that everyone should have. Uh, and this one more point, which is, uh, uh, this is not about mixing large amounts, because there's no way you can mix a, hundred, a million F through a mixer, because you need so many deposits, so many withdrawals, it's not going to be worth the time. You might as well use the banking system, which is used traditionally to launder money. So this is just a small amount that you want to get privacy for, for small purchases or for paper gas. There's no way you can launder your, your entire fortune it, through, through a mix on Ethereum. It's not going to happen. OK, now I want to ask you about this uh, a DEX case, a DEX use case for mixers. What does that look like, if you can? Yeah, sure. Um, so 
Um, um, so long, long story short, uh, so like uh, right now we all do the problem with the DEX, so uh, horrible uh, user experience and terrible uh, liquidity uh, volume. So um, so uh, we right now using uh, zero knowledge proof to uh, to scale up the uh, throughput, uh, which is really successful. But uh, but like um, like because. Uh, uh, like most of the decks is like uh, they are not licensed decks. People don't want to do the KYC. But uh, we also talk to the regulators. Like uh, they want to uh, they, they want to license uh, or they they want to regulate the decentralized exchange. Uh, but then um, to enable to enable the uh, like large whale or institutional investors to come to trade on the decks because Dex is because we are very close to the Hong Kong uh, Stock Exchange Commission. So like for them uh, like. Uh, if you're a centralized exchange, you have to prove your custody is really safe, which is really hard. But for decentralized uh, decentral exchange, this is like uh, it's, it's very native, so uh, you're on your own. It's uh, super safe, and and then um, but but in traditional because I have a uh, traditional financial background, so uh, like in, like a uh, traditional PE, if they want to uh, buy us or buy some uh, stock stocks, they they don't disclose straight away. They start to buy staking. Once they reach this certain amount, then they will release the news says we will purchase like five percent, two percent, like Berkshire as way, They will say I bought uh, two percent of uh, Coca Cola shares, but which they already done. So, uh, so like right now, it's really hard. Uh, even they do it on central exchange, um, people can see a large amount of says USDT or USDC or Dai transfer into central exchange, and uh, most most like it would be like uh, a large purchase or even for. Um, uh, even if they can disclose this part, but uh, central exchange knows that someone uh, like in a corporate account is going to purchase like what kind of tokens. Uh, but for the central exchange, yeah, we use Mixer, uh, which will, will be our next stage. So we can so can like hide those kind of information for uh, institutional uh, institutional investors. Yeah, this is our case. Um, the way that you've described these protocols, they sound very much like they're layer two. They're like on top of existing blockchains. But like, is there, and maybe I'm wrong here, so correct me if I'm wrong, but are there also, like, are they competing with those protocols that are coming out with it built in? I don't think uh, it's, I think you're, uh Touching the subject of uh, how how you can utilize zero knowledge proof as a scalability solution, and there are companies and projects that are actually trying to solve that problem. Uh, in I think in our case, in the Mixer's case, uh, we're not trying to solve that. And in in case of Tornado Cash, uh, it's not a layer two solution because we don't have any meta transactions off chain, and we don't have any roadmap for that. Uh, we are only going to be working on a layer one solution, so every transaction is going to be uh, mined and published on uh, uh, But to answer your question, yes, we can utilize uh, zero knowledge proof protocol for scalability and layer two solutions, such as MetaWeb. So. Okay, I just have one question. How much time do we have? Uh, you have uh, 10 minutes or something? Because I have, I have one last question, but I also want to open up the floor, although we only have one You mic. have 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Uh, sorry. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So I'm going to ask a last question, and I'm going to sort of throw it out there that I will be opening up for questions. So if you want to think about your questions now and get them ready, that would be good. Um, but I have one last question, which I'm sure is like everyone's least favorite question, which is about like regulators and the law. So, how legal are mixers, and how do you deal with that? How do you even think about it? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I mean, the code I, I write is open source and out there, and anybody can do my code. Because it's open source, they can copy and use it. So. <laughs> um, I'm not a lawyer either. Uh, I did a law studies back in university, um, but uh, um, yeah, uh, like in the traditional financial world, like Nasdaq or New York Stock Exchange, uh, they even allows those kind of work, a very similar function as a mixer. So you can do those kind of dark pool, or um, you can like the, uh, the broker can purchase stocks anonymously. And uh, um, I think somehow the legislation they can figure out how to um, how to adopt 
blockchain uh, mixers maybe in the future, but right now I don't think it's very friendly, even like just like blockchain, and like, it's it's gonna take a bit time for them to understand. They just don't like innovation and creation stuff. So we do think about regulation a lot at Arjun, and that's actually why Hopper is an open source project. It's a separate application, and it's not part of Arjun because it's such a gray area that we don't want to make things uh, too rapidly. There is a clear problem with Mixer is that if you use a Mixer and really, I mean, this is companies looking at that on chain, they may actually flag your address as having been used a Mixer, and you start to kind of taint your coins, and I think that's a real problem. This. For me, I see two reasons to have privacy. As you mentioned, you don't want people to know exactly how much fund you have and who you have transacted to. But it's also a way to preserve fungibility, meaning that one eater should be one eater irrespective of you know, who has sent it and what's the history of that eater. And now, for regulators, if you start to use a mixer, they may actually take your account and actually mixers can be kind of counter uh, productive in that sense, that your account may be flagged, and so then you have no way to actually exit your crypto to the fiat system because your attendant and some exchange will not accept your, your cryptocurrency. So I think this is a, a real problem today that, that needs to be fixed by regulators, fortunately not us, but I think it's still, there's still a lot of value to provide the technology and hopefully hope that they will, uh, regulation will go in the right direction. Unfortunately, uh, we already see some pressure from governments like Japan for example, they ban uh, uh, private cryptocurrency that enable uh, privacy, like Monero, Zcash. Um, so we are going to have some issues with that, I believe. Uh, in the last year, there was a one mixer that was seized by uh, Europol. Uh, they, because uh, it's very important how you advertise the mixer. If you advertise your mixer like you're gonna help some guys to do something, you probably should never advertise it this way, you're gonna be in a huge trouble. Uh, so it's very important that we, we do, to make it a clear message to the governments and regulators that this is not our goal. Our goal is to have the private transactions, to enable privacy. Um, yeah, that's kind of it, unfortunately. Yeah. The state is unknown. We don't know what the other countries are going to do about the regulations and how it's, it's going to go. Okay, so thank you for answering that. I could tell that was a little painful for you. I <laughs> appreciate it. I think it was informative. Okay, so I'm going to open up the floor. There's only one mic, so I guess I'm going to be running around. I think you actually came to me first, and then you. Thanks. I just have like a question, comment to the last the topic is it's interesting. So don't do you think that that problem can be actually addressed by hopefully coming identity systems where you can just um, construct a, a mixer that accepts, for example, uh, payments only from um, identities that can prove that they have KYC, but without revealing anything more. And that mixer, mixer at least for the anonymity, uh, is as good as, as, as anything else, and uh, authorities should be more or less right in something like that. Yeah. I think, do you mind that? <laughs> I mean, I want to say yes. I think this is clearly one potential solution. I think it is uh, also possible, I think, to keep the proof. So you may have your privacy, but it is still if regulation or government ask you to prove where the funds come from, it is probably possible to being able to show that, so you can actually keep that secret and only if you are requested prove that you know the origin of the fund. So I think there are solutions to, to address that case. But I think if somebody is going to execute that solution, that means there is going to be some central company that is going to keep records of all those QIC applications and forms, so yeah. that would basically, we're going to create another central bank. Well, not, not, not necessarily, but that moves the problem to how you exactly uh, build like identity <coughs> systems. And this can also present zero knowledge proof that you have KYC. Sure, but we're going to give the power to that central authority. It, it doesn't have to be central, but yeah. Fuck KYC. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this is also on the same subject as the last question. I'm not sure if it was answered in the last prep question here. Um, but are there proposed technical solutions to uh, tainted coins? Uh, the idea of um, being able to take these tokens, which should be fungible uh, and are being made by exchanges to be non-fungible, is there a proposed technical solution to treating them as fungible again or making exchanges be unable to recognize them as such? Uh, I think technically there are some ideas how to solve that, but it's not very easy to provide those solutions. For example, like everywhere should uh, like burn the address after it's used and like use the new address uh, for reware transaction and the smart contracts. Uh, since you know all the mixers have like a one smart contract and they, uh, all the like companies like chain analysis, they can basically parse all the uh, transactions and detect, okay, this transaction reweights somehow to mixer, so it could be whack. Um, that problem could be kind of solved by create to low code, but again, it's so in a, those ideas all in the air, and uh, we're not there yet to think about those problems right now. We're still in a very, very early stage where we just need to solve how to do basic mixing for now. Then maybe like later on, once we figure it out, we will work on something like this. Okay, I think this is probably going to be the last question. Do you mind just coming up? This probably won't. So my question is um, about the UX and implementing a mixer in some sort of wallet. Um, so obviously like having a mixer would be great, but if the only people are using it are people who think they need privacy for some reason, and it's not for some ideological reason, then it might not be the best mixer because everybody is using it. Might be bad. So how do we get people to actually want to use it, and how do we make that UX like, seamless and easy? Have you tried Such an interesting question, actually. Do you have some ideas on this? Okay. Um, so if I understood the question correctly, uh, you're worried about the UI UX problems in the uh, current state of the wallets? I'm going to try to rephrase it. Yeah. I think his question was not so much just UX UI is bad, but rather how do you get sort of the regular user to use it? Because if only irregular users are using it, then it could become very kind of like tainted or it would be seen as dangerous. What you want is the regular users. Is that kind of what yeah. you're saying? Yeah, thank you. If you guys don't have Personally, I, I don't think the UX UI of, of Mixer is that complicated. I think it can be made simple. I think Tornado kind of did a great job at Hopper. I think it is as simple except that because it's an alpha, we didn't put fancy UI on top of it. But I think the steps are actually easy to understand. You can tell a user, you send your phone, it's one click, and then to withdraw, actually, it's another click. And you invite the user. I think the difficulty is to invite the user to behave uh, smartly in when to withdraw. And I think that's the most difficult part in terms of UX. But again, there are solutions you can actually block the withdrawal until a certain time, or there are still that can be, can be done at the UI level. So personally, I don't think the UI is a real challenge uh, for adoption. The, the main challenge, I think, is, is regulation. I'm actually going to grab it. Let's give one last question. I just think that users have to be educated about privacy. Uh, and I think if people I think when you saw the Equifax hacks and the stolen revelations, people started acting differently, and that kind of education is useful in the in the long term, so that people can be more motivated to use mixes. So I don't think we really have much more time, but if Bear, you want to say something? Yeah, just to respond to that question, I think that we should try and integrate with wallets and have this new feature similar with a browser where you have create new private tab. I would like to have create new private address. I think that that's an idea that people can understand, and it's like the first step for like having these bigger mixer pools and these mixer integrations. I can say quickly something on top of that. Sure, sure. Yes. In Arjun, actually, your initial idea was to enable what we call uh, incognito wallets. 
So basically, you have your origin wallet, and actually within your origin wallet, you can create an incognito wallet and actually use a mixer to transfer some funds between those two. I think so, yeah. We want it really to reproduce what you do in Chrome. You open an incognito tab, you can do incognito wallets. So I do believe that this is a nice way to, to solve that problem and to incentivize users and make it simple for them to use it. All right. I think we got a lot of points in. I want to say thank you to our panelists for joining. I want to say thank you. I do this in two days, but I forgot to introduce myself. So I'm Anna, and I'm the co-host of a podcast called Zero Knowledge. We talk about topics sort of related to this, and a lot of Zero Knowledge stuff. So if you're into it, please check it out. It's called the Zero Knowledge Podcast. <laughs>